Welcome to Outrage and Optimism. I'm Tom Rivett Karnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. This week, we ask whether net zero is really under threat in the UK. We speak to the brilliant author and now activist Yuval Noah Harari. And we have music from Nio. Thanks for being here. Again, so much going on in the world and we have to kind of cut through it and identify the things that we want to talk to you about. Um, And one thing we've picked up on this week is the interesting story that's coming out of the UK. The group of MPs called the Net Zero Scrutiny Group, 19 Conservatives, is attempting to derail the government's green agenda, basically by linking the cost of living crisis to the idea that that is created by the net zero targets. It's driving up energy prices and they are doing what they can to get the government to water down their net zero target. This is causing concern. People, friends like Laurence Tubiana, Fatih Birol, Jennifer Morgan have come out and encouraged the UK just three months after COP26 not to water down its targets. So there's different ways of looking at this, but I think it's an interesting doorway into some of the ways in which economics and politics are intersecting right now on climate. So let's just kick off there. What have both of you heard about this? What's your impressions of what's going on here? And are you worried? Well, as the only non-Brit on this show, may I have the luxury today of actually asking you some questions, (laughs) the two Brits? As long as you don't expect us to know everything that's going on. But yes, go ahead. Go for it. So first, just, just so that we can have clarity about what we're talking about, this conversation that you're alluding to, Tom, Mm. does not have to do with the other conversation of what net zero is or is not. Is it a real zero? Is it net zero? Is it using offsets? Does it have a roof to the offsets? Is it 10%? It has nothing to do with that or does it? No, you are absolutely correct. And what you're referring to there is the fact that there is quite a bit of hand-wringing going on in the corporate space about what does net zero mean? Um, who's doing what and how can it be relied upon. This is different. This is about the UK as a national target and what that is doing to energy prices or not doing to energy prices. Okay, good. So just so that we can establish, because to the first issue, we still have a an episode yep. pending yes. that we would like to um, tee up. Okay, so let's just establish that. So given that that is the case, then as a non-Brit who doesn't even live there anymore, could somebody please explain to me why the cost of living that in all other spaces has to do with difficulties in transportation, in container shipping, and especially into rising prices of fossil fuels, why is that cost of living now being put on renewables or decarbonization? Could could you just give me the logic of that? What is the logic, Tom? What is the logic? We need to know. There are lots of listeners outside the UK. It's obviously a very UK thing. Christiana's asked a direct question. You're in the line of sight, the rabbit in the headlines. You're on the spot. Go, Tom. I, 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 don't think it's, I don't think it's a UK thing, actually, because I think this argument can increasingly be used around the world. So the point here is that we are seeing a very precipitous rise in the cost of fossil fuels. Gas is six times, nearly six times more expensive now than it was 12 months ago. Um, we are seeing you know, a very significant rise in the price of oil. And these, in the UK, these conservative MPs are looking at that and saying, the solution to this is obviously to allow fracking in the Midlands in the UK, to drill more oil wells in the North Sea. And that's how we bring down these costs that are hurting people. That's the argument. Okay, so so, so the logic is here we have an, an acid, a good, fossil fuels, and we know from history that the price is completely volatile and then goes up and down quicker than anything we have ever seen. It can go to negative 10 all the way up to 140, 150. And we know that that volatility will continue. And so the argument is in order to protect ourselves and buffer ourselves from that volatility, we should invest more into them. That's correct. That's the argument. Well, can somebody explain that argument to me? (laughs) 
Well, it's a completely spurious argument that has been constructed on the basis of an ideological position, obviously. These people are trying to look for ways in which they can shoot net zero down because, of course, you don't have to think about this for very long to think it might be that if you put a massive investment into drilling, you could increase supply in the UK and drive down prices in the short term. Although, of course, energy is a global market. So the truth is you probably couldn't do that even in the UK. You would just allow profit... <laughs> just nodding for the listeners. ...profit gouging by those companies. The only way you protect consumers is by insulating homes, investing in renewable energy, both domestic as well as large-scale off offshore um, uh, wind, and electrifying the economy... But there is this group that are now trying to use this populist argument of support for lower income people and tie that, as has been done successfully over decades, so it's a real threat. People have often said the green transition is too expensive, so therefore people on low incomes need us to invest in fossil fuels. And it's dangerous, I think, politically. Um, well, is it dangerous? That's the question. Paul, you haven't come in yet. What do you think? Well, I was waiting for the moment, Tom, when you would kind of have yourself, you know, skewered on a pin like a butterfly, ready for me to kind of pounce with um, <laughs> the same argument I always use about everything. Um, and actually, I want to draw attention to... Um, Am I in that state now, by the way? Uh, you are, you okay. are. Uh, <laughs> this beautiful... I wish I could pronounce the name for butterfly collectors. It's a fantastic word. It's like... Lepidologist. Lepid Thank you. Very, there you go. Fantastic word. Uh, last week, uh, for those who are interested uh, or remember, um, I criticised... Um, an. ESG or a, or a sustainable investment whistleblower called Tarek Fancy because he had said that all the, the, everything that the investors were doing was kind of greenwash and it was all about the government. But I want to uh, draw attention of the listeners to the fact that he completely redeemed himself. And this is related to the point you just made, Tom. You said they're doing this something ideological. And I want to focus on the word motive here. Why are they doing this? You said it was ideological. I don't think it is. I think it's greed. I actually think they're doing it because they're being paid to do it. This is what Tarek Fancy said, uh, and I think it's a wonderful article on the 10th of February. He said, in the wake of the US Supreme Court's Citizens United decision in 2010, unknown amounts of untraceable corporate spending intended to influence elections and legislation have been sloshing around the system. It's no wonder that the majority of Americans feel that the economy is rigged in favour of the wealthiest and the most powerful. And he makes a particular point saying that government's got a role as a referee, uh, that government needs to make the rules. He uses a wonderful phrase. He says, uh, there's a difference between government as provider and government as regulator. Governments should no more build electric vehicles than a referee should take free throws. But if the referees don't call fouls and enforce the boundaries, who will? So what we've done as a society, a global society, a national society in the UK, for example, is we've recognised we've got to stay uh, below 1.5. We, we've got to reach net zero by 2050. Those are the rules. And I think money... Uh, is uh, infecting those rules and breaking them. Can I follow up? Yeah, no, I just want to make a quick point, which is okay. as Paul's now directly accused 19 MPs of corruption, I'd just like to point out that it was Paul and not Tom that did that for uh, when the lawsuit comes Well, to... I mean, you know, when we say, say accused, I think that's a very strong word. Yeah, I think that's I, right. I, what I would Christiano. Like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, just following on my line of questions here to both of you Brits, um, so you use the word populist. And I, I believe that was you, Tom, mm -hmm. said, you know, there's a populist argument. It was Tom, Tom, T-O-M, Tom. Okay. Um, and I just wonder how popular is this populist um, argument? Is this, you know, 50%, 60%, 70%, 80% of the UK public? What are, what are the numbers on this? What, what does the majority or the minority of UK citizens, what is their opinion about this? It's, it's a great question, Christiana, and I think actually this points to something else peculiar that's going on in our politics, which is support for net zero and for dealing with the climate crisis in the UK is at an all-time high. Something like mm. in the 80% 80, 80 plus of people very strongly support strong action on climate. So it's not really populism. It's kind of pseudo-populism. It's presented yes. in the context of a populist argument but bizarrely is actually... But it's not popular. But it's actually not popular, right? It's actually against the wishes of the majority of people. It's a great point. But actually, Oscar Wilde said, it's not public opinion that needs changing. It is the mind of public officials. Uh, I'm not sure what their motivations were back in the days when Oscar Wilde was having his problems with the authorities, but... Uh, 
But, I, you know, the, the public, I think, you know, if you ask the public, you know, do you want your children to be safe? What are they going to say? It's yeah. not a very complicated question, is it? Well, and, and I mean, we've had this not completely the same situation, but the, the holding to ransom of the Build Back Better agenda in the US by Senators Cinema and Manchin on the basis of a populist argument for a minority of people in their states, holding back progress for everybody. It's very interesting, and you've, you've drawn a sharp distinction there, Christiana, that I think is well worth remembering, that even in the US, right, there was the union of coal miners came out and asked Manchin to change his position. Actually, we have a situation where the vast majority of people, as you just said, Paul, understand the risk, don't want to be in a position where our lawmakers put us in greater risk and don't deal with it and want to be responsible. But we're ha we have a small minority of, of lawmakers who are not going along with that and are using populist arguments against it. And this is actually where I think we need to come back. And friends in government that I've spoken to about this issue have made this point. And in fact, Ed Miliband also made this point. We should probably just ignore this group of MPs in the UK. There's 19 of them. They're sort of more the lunatic fringe. Some of them are real climate 19 skeptics. 19 out of how many? Just, well, just to I mean, have the, a the majority is, is, three, is over 350, the Conservative majority. There's 600 MPs in Parliament. So why are we paying attention to this, to this issue when the UK government is legally required to reduce its emissions to net zero, um, it has to, to break from that would require an act of parliament. But what we see right now is the media giving a huge amount of attention to this small group of lawmakers. And maybe we've just made it worse by bringing it up on this podcast. But the conclusion that I would come to, uh, and someone is saying we've dedicated 12 minutes to it here. Um, <laughs> But the conclusion that I would well come done, to team. is actually... Well done, team. we managed to solve this problem by creating actually, it. We've made it worse, but our, 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 our suggestion at the end of this is unless there is some indication that ministers or number 10 or others are picking this up, we shouldn't allow this to divert from the fact that the UK and other countries that have laws are now on an irreversible path to net zero. Do you both think that's right? Or do you think both think the risk of this is sufficiently great that we should pay attention to it when it comes up? Christiana's thinking... Um, could I ask both of you to please define populist in the context that we're talking about? After you, Paul. <laughs> uh, the, the term populism I really came to be acquainted with through the election of Donald Trump, where there appeared to be some quite interesting and unusual dynamics going on. Um, someone who would appear in policy terms to be interested in promoting the interests of the richer people uh, to some extent and reducing environmental standards became associated with being a champion of poorer people and 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 the, and the sort of uh, ignored um and and I think that that sort of spirit of um, fury with existing uh, political structures that you've see you see in um, for example this sort of strange Canadian trucker demonstrations that's a kind of anti-vax there are many examples across the world where democracies seem to be so bad at kind of looking after their people to a certain extent um, you get leaders who are kind of like a brick being thrown through a window but actually, you, you, you know, when you think of, of, for example, in the United States, where there's you know 40, over 40 million people below the poverty line, you can see why people would want to throw that brick. So that's my definition of populism. Tom? I mean, populism is basically a political approach to appeal to ordinary people who feel like their needs have been ignored by the elites. But actually, I think what we're seeing is people coming out who claim that they are appealing to ordinary people who have been ignored by the elites, but actually proposing and pre presenting very elitist policies in the name of that. So um, mm, maybe, we, I don't know exactly. quite what we call it. Yeah. So we're going to have to go to our interview in just a sec. Christiane, anything else to add or further questions for us before we flip over? No, my, my concluding thought is um, before we make statements that use words that are quite conveniently used or misused, it's probably better to think through the signage of words and think through that to figure out what is the motivation that mm. is truly behind these statements. Forget about, you know, what 
the adjective that we might put on those, but what is the motivation? And, um, and I think if we get a clarity on the motivation, we might be able to understand the statements better. Yeah. Anyway, to my two British friends, thank you very much for holding um, the torch and explaining quite well what is going on in wonderful UK. <laughs> wonderful is generous, given what's been going on in the UK recently and the fact that it's February, but we appreciate it. God uh, save little UK, <laughs> we need some help. Right. Thank you, Christiana, thank you. So, so this week we have a very exciting guest for you, uh, welcoming back to the podcast Yuval Noah mm. Harari, of course, one of the world's most famous uh, public intellectuals, thinkers, historian, author of many books, including Sapiens and Homo Deus. Um, Yuval recently came out with a campaign to try to persuade public officials and everybody that 2% of GDP would be sufficient to deal with the climate and nature crises. And what's beautiful about this is the simplicity of it and the amount of background work that's gone into thinking how this would work. So we dug into this just a couple of days ago with Yuval. Here's the conversation and we'll be back afterwards with more discussion. Yuval, thank you so much for joining us once again on Outrage and Optimism. It is quite a privilege to have you on again. Um, many, many wonderful uh, greetings to you and to Itzik as we start uh, this new year that is actually going to be a very, very critical year. And how wonderful to, um, to know that you are launching a campaign. Uh, so now you're not just a historian, an intellectual, a writer. Uh, you're actually a uh, turned into a climate activist and an, uh, someone who's Yay. going to be doing advocacy. So welcome, welcome, yeah. welcome to the club. It's yes. fantastic. <laughs> um, but Yuval, you you really put things actually quite simply and quite profoundly. And you're saying, and I, and I quote in your Time article, the crucial news is that the price tag of preventing the apocalypse, and I love the way you use that word, <laughs> the apocalypse is in the low single digits of annual global GDP. In fact, it is 2%. And obviously the idea is not yours, as you point out. Uh, mm -hmm. Many economists have actually landed on that number. But how, how did you, and Itzik, I'm assuming, Mm -hmm. uh, land on the idea of making a campaign out of this. Hmm. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me again. It's, it's, it's a real pleasure to, to be here and to meet you again. And, um, you know, I, I'm not a climate scientist. I don't have any particular kind of insights into the science behind the numbers. I'm a historian. I understand, I try to understand uh, political movements, political structures, the long-term course of human history. And when I look at the climate crisis, the question that I'm asking myself is what kind of political project do we need in order to prevent catastrophic climate change? Hmm. And very often when you try to define the nature of a, a political project or the kind of political project you need, a good place to start is with the bottom line, with the price tag. How much would it cost? There is a huge difference between political projects that cost, say, 0.1% uh, of GDP and political projects that cost, I don't know, 50% of, of GDP. The 50% kind of projects are almost impossible except under very special circumstances. If we look at the history of the 20th century, so what kind of political projects managed to kind of uh, uh, rely on 50% on of, to, to use 50% of, of GDP of a country, it's usually total war. Hmm. The Second World War, I mean, the, 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 the uh, allies, had to invest roughly, let's say, 40, 50% of GDP in order to win it. And the Axis powers spent almost their entire GDP on losing it. <laughs> luckily, <laughs> luckily. <laughs> luckily, yeah. And, but this, this is a kind of ballpark figure. Now, almost no other project 
like a reform of healthcare systems, the building of an education system, uh, anything like that, if it costs 50% of GDP, forget it. A country won't be able to do it because it won't be able to mobilize the political will, the political capital to do it. So when I look at, at trying to prevent the, the, the climate apocalypse, catastrophic climate change, a key question is how much will it cost in terms of, of global GDP? Hmm. And when you read many of the articles and comments and blogs, and then you get sometimes the impression that um, we will probably need to, I don't know, dismantle modern civilization and the modern economy and start from scratch, or that we will have to complete, I don't know, go back to live in caves if we want to stop it. And the impression you often get is like, this is something like a, a world war. We'll need 50% of global GDP to do it. And uh, this is like terrible news uh, because it means that the, the kind of political project we need is almost impossible. But then when, when you look at the numbers, and then one thing I realized as I try to look at the numbers, it's very difficult to find the numbers. That you know, you have this one number, very important number that got a lot of attention, 1.5 degrees Celsius. We need to prevent uh, uh, global temperature from rising above 1.5 degrees Celsius. But then when you look for the price tag, it's extremely difficult to find it. <laughs> and, I, and I, not just me, but like I mean, my entire team spent weeks going over all kinds of reports and panels and articles and so forth. And it turns out that there, there, there is a number, or at least there are numbers. And of course, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to play with numbers. It's a, a lot of speculations and guesswork, but almost all the numbers, they are in the single digit, low single digits of global GDP. Uh, many of them are around 2% of global GDP. And this is like a wonderful piece of news because it means it's a feasible political project. 2% of global GDP every year is, of course, a lot of money. Hmm. But um, it's exactly the kind of project that modern political systems have been built to deal with. We don't need to invent a completely new kind of politics. Politicians, this is their typical job. When they wake up in the morning, they go to the office. What do they do? They move 2% of resources from here to there. <laughs> So that, I I love I love that description <laughs> of the life of a politician. <laughs> you know, by the way, just a little thing. I think on COVID, they went to the office and they moved about fifteen percent of GDP for yeah. about a year. You yes, know? and and and, and, yeah. and you know, in the UK where I live, one in five hundred people died of COVID, and they moved fifteen percent of GDP. So you know, it's interesting. And exactly. So again, this is kind of a, 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 an inspiring number, if you want, that when we face a major crisis, not a world war, but a pandemic, politicians can very quickly, you know, we didn't take decades, within a couple of months, maybe even a couple of weeks, they managed to kind of change priorities, shuffle things around and move 15%. But, the, but, the, hospi but the hospitals were kind of full and there was that urgency that you also have in wartime. So can I ask you, how does, a, how does you know, we, we've, you know, uh, it's, it's ending now and maybe that's your point, but there used to be this, mm -hmm. you know, people would talk about the climate debate or whatever. There, it's not a debate anymore. It kind of is about, you know, we were talking last week about is gas a transition fuel? So there's still, there's always going to be debate. But yeah. how does a debate turn into a political project? Mm. Um, it has to become concrete. Somebody needs to come up with concrete goals. And again, it's, it's, it's not just about money, of course. We will need to change many other things, our behaviors, even to some extent, our, uh, our, our psychology. But a very good place to start is with money. Just where does it go? What sums are allocated to which purposes? So it, it, it means different taxation systems but it also means different investments. And um, this is the kind of the essence of politics. This is what politicians are, are again, they are quite good at doing it. Mm. It's just a question of what are the interests 
that are being served by this kind of horse trading. Hmm. If I can ask just just to go back to before Paul's question, I think it's so it's so yeah. interesting to put this number on it, two percent of GDP, and it really makes it very tangible that actually this is achievable. And I want to ask you a couple more questions about despair, which mm-hmm. you reference very interestingly in time. But but I bet you there's quite a number of listeners that are, are are hearing this and thinking this is really hopeful. But what does it really look like? What does that money get spent on? Who does it get spent mm-hmm. by? Could you just make that a little bit concrete for us with some examples? Yeah. So like investing in Uh, researching new kinds of technologies that, for instance, would replace the internal combustion engine by better, safer, and greener ways of transportation. It means building infrastructure, whether it's a new kind of electrical grid or whether it's planting trees. Um, There are so, again, it's, it's, in the end, it's tangible things in your house, in your neighborhood, in your country. And it's the the kind of project that humanity has been doing for centuries. I mean, if you look at all the roads out there, I mean, somebody had to pay in order to build them. Hmm. If you look at the electric grid, this was a huge investment. So we need these kinds of investments again in better infrastructure and better technology. And the the good, the the, the important message here is that it's not about throwing the money away. Hmm. It's not some kind of, I don't know, uh, uh, um, big ritual that you take piles of banknotes and burn them as an offering to the spirits of the sky. (laughs) And this will protect us from climate. No, I mean, you invest this, let's say, in building a new electric grid. Yeah. And which means that uh, the money is is not thrown away. It actually creates jobs. It can create economic prosperity. So this kind of binary thinking that, okay, modern economics destroyed the climate. So in order to save the climate, we need to destroy the economy. It won't work. You won't get enough people, enough governments, enough businesses on board with this kind of thinking. So it should be a win-win situation. Yes, it's, it's, it won't be easy. Otherwise, it would have been done long ago. Sure. But in the long term, we are talking about actual investments that will also create economic prosperity and better lives and not just uh, prevent catastrophic climate change. Yuval, let me ask you about the timing of your campaign, because everything you've said and the, and the campaign and everything that you're writing about this must be music to the ears of at least one economist, Nick Stern, who wrote the Stern Report in 2006 mm-hmm. and said way back then that it would cost approximately 2%. And frankly, no decent economist has substantially um, disagreed with him in the years since. So this number has been pretty well established. Now, you seem to have confidence, trust, hope, faith, I don't know which noun to use. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> All of them. That at this point, there is a much better chance that this message of the 2% is actually going to be not just listened to, but acted upon. Why do you think that this is a much more pregnant moment for that? Because we don't have much choice. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, we, we, we've tried doing nothing. I was, afraid, I was afraid it would be all complicated, but it's not. Really. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've tried doing nothing. It didn't succeed. <laughs> uh, and we are running out of time. And humans have this tendency uh, to try, I mean, to try every course of action before they try the kind the right of, one. Uh, the, the, the right one, yeah. And we've tried other things, and the thing and, and the situation is just, just getting worse and worse, and we don't have much time. Now, honestly, I, 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 I can't guarantee that it actually will happen. I mean, humans are known to also make terrible mistakes on a large, large scale, and uh, we might do so again. I mean, so yeah, I don't have the kind of full confidence that maybe, I mean, when I say that um, we just need to invest 2% of global GDP, 
it doesn't mean that it will actually happen. It just means that it's it's feasible. Hmm. Because what what I uh, what I saw again as a historian over the last five years or so is this shift in the yeah. public mood from denial to despair. Yeah. That five years ago, and no, nah, this is just a hoax. So this is just uh, overblown, and it will happen in like two hundred years. So why why worry about it now? And then very quickly. It's, it's all over. It's too late. The apocalypse is here. There is nothing we can do. Let's just have fun while we can. And we need to stop in the middle between denial and despair uh, in actual responsibility and, 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 and taking action. Um, and the time is, is, is now whether there is enough mm, uh, motivation whether the, the political will is there, I'm not sure. I mean, we are talking at a time when there is a major crisis in Eastern Europe, uh, which is extremely worrying on so many different levels. Yeah. But I'm afraid that, you know, if, if Russia invades Ukraine, one of the casualties would be uh, the, the, the ability to stop climate change. If you have a major war in Eastern Europe, the money that should have been spent on uh, uh, new eco-friendly technology will go to tanks and cyber, cyber weapons. And with all the need for to, to uh, immediately find energy resources, let's say that Russia cuts off gas to Europe, then maybe they turn back to coal. Because they or, have or no renewables choice. renewables though, but it could go either way. I mean, once again, we can be positive yeah. that uh, an energy crisis but I mean, Yuval, I, I, I do think it's inspiring the way you're coming at this. And I wanted you to help settle this family argument I have with Tom. Uh, <laughs> like, is it, you know, I, 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 you know, I've spent the last 20 years working on climate change outside of government. I'm not aware because, we've been having an argument for 20 years. Already, but anyway, because, <laughs> because I didn't think the government, I thought the government was basically controlled by business. And therefore you couldn't go to the government. But would you agree? Well, I think you're telling me actually this. So I'm agreeing with you or that the last five years are critical because now you think that there is a consensus and now it is all about government. And here we, I, I talk a lot about taxation and regulation, but you're talking more about like subsidy and incentives. But the point mm -hmm. is the governing instrument, right? Do you think now is is the, the end game? Yeah, because governments have still have a lot more power than most businesses. And if they want to do something big quickly, they can do it. Again, the, the, the basic kind of, um, I don't know, uh, 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 example to go to is a major war. When a major war erupts, governments can very quickly shift enormous amounts of resources to deal with it. Yeah, but because that's their, their job. You know, Hobbes, when they talked about the Leviathan in 1650, yeah. said that, you know, the Leviathan, the state protects us. It's their primary job. So I guess now you, the, yeah. the writer, the, the, you know, you're super famous around the world. You have such a, a megaphone that you've earned through your clarity of thought. As you approach being an activist, how do you see we can maybe build um, a recognition that climate change is, is, uh, is, is uh, a, a security issue? Uh, hold on. Can I pile in on that question, Juval, before yeah. you answer? Because mm -hmm. it seems to me the difference between a war and climate change is that a war or the pandemic is acute. Yes. There is no, you know, there's no doubt that the enemy is on our front doorstep. But with climate, the threat is not acute. It's chronic. Yes. It is existential. Hence, it is what goes way beyond a war or a pandemic. But it is chronic. And so that, to me, is the difficulty here. How mm -hmm. do you unleash uh, warlike, if you will, warlike <laughs> speed of policy decisions when the threat is much greater but is much slower in its oncoming. Yes, I mean, that's the big challenge in terms of, um, again, uh, 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 making this political project come together. But we can gain inspiration maybe from a very unlikely uh, and unappetizing examples. If you think, for example, about uh, the resistance to immigration, Think about the immigration crisis in Europe in 2015-16, or think about the resistance to immigration uh, in the United States. And you hear people say that it's 
they also describe it as a kind of chronic problem. Hmm. I mean, it's obvious that it's not like in the next month the immigrants will take over the country. No, it will take time. If you go to the UK, so one, one date they often, uh, the anti-immigrant camp often wave around is 2066, which is a thousand years, of course, from the Battle of Hastings. So it's a nice number. And they say in 2066, immigrants will be the majority in the UK. And this is a long time from now. And it's, it's still enough to create enormous emotional uh, engagement in order to kind of uh, 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 topple and raise governments. So it's, it's not true that only kind of immediate acute invasions of foreign armies are enough to create this kind of, of motivation. I'll, I'll give another example from, from, from the Middle East. Um, you know, in, in, in Jerusalem, there is a certain wall, and near the wall, there is a certain building. <laughs> and if anybody <laughs> would say, take one stone out of the wall, or one stone out of the building, or, or, or blow them up, all hell will break loose. Indeed. We are talking about millions and hundreds of millions of people all over the world that never been to Jerusalem, are rising up in arms. And um, this is just about one war, which they never even visited. Hmm. And then you think about the Great Coral Reef, which was built not by a bunch of people 2,000 years ago, but by billions of organisms over millions of years. If you think about the Amazon rainforests, and they're in danger, and people say, yeah, it's bad, but I'm not, I'm not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. Why is it? Why? Yes. That the kind of this war has so much more emotional power than the Great Coral Reef or than the Amazon rainforest. It's not because one is acute and the other is chronic. It's because some people at least have been raised on, on stories about this war and not about the Great Coral Reef. Mm. But it's in the end, in the, in the stories that we are told and that create this kind of emotional engagement. If we can create the same type of emotional engagement uh, with the Great Coral Reef or with the Amazon rainforest, then yeah, you can mobilize a lot of people to take very strong action. Stories need to be kind of engaging and simple. One of the reasons to focus on, on the 2% number is that it's a simple number. It's easy to grasp it. So whenever we try to uh, create powerful stories that will get translated into political projects, we need powerful symbols and we need to keep things as simple as possible. So... Um, that, that, that's part of, 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 of how you go about doing it. Hmm. You know, that is such a beautiful explanation. I'd never really drawn that distinction between the emotional connection and the story of these human created structures and then these natural environments. That is, thank you so much for setting that out like that. And also the clarity and the simplicity of the story. I want to just connect to that. You start your Time article by saying that climate despair is as dangerous as denial. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that connects to what you just said, that it's because it doesn't allow us to build a coherent story around the future that we're trying to create. Well, it's, it's not just that it, it kind of prevents clarity. Uh, it saps at the motivation to do anything. Even if you are... Even if you're extremely motivated, you care very deeply about the environment, you care very deeply about future generations, but you feel it's hopeless, it's too late to do anything, then actually the clearer the message of, 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 how, of the threat we are facing, you just get more depressed and uh, you go in the direction of escapism. Whether escapism means uh, okay, I'll, I'll just watch TV all day as long as TV lasts. <laughs> or I'll, 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 I'll build a, a, a bunker in New Zealand or Alaska and, and hide there because the apocalypse is coming. 
again, to get a political project going, you need fine tuning mm. between making people realize the danger they're facing, but not frightening them too much to the degree that they feel that it's it's impossible to do anything. It's it's too late. Yeah. No. I mean, we don't. We, the apocalypse is unthinkable. So we we have many, many thousands of listeners, even more when you're on our podcast, one of the most popular guests we've ever had. Um, when you speak to those people about what we can do, what, what, what are the practical steps that, that people can take to, to kind of enact this 2% principle? Um, the most important part is actually uh, spreading the message and putting pressure on the politicians and on government officials mm -hmm. and on businesses to, to come on board. It's, of course, the actions you take yourself as an individual are important, but it's much more important to influence the centers of power. So whether it's, uh, you know, writing emails or demonstrations or anything that will get the message to other people and especially to the politicians and to the business leaders. And I think that many of them are actually willing to, uh, uh, to respond to the demand if they feel that they have the public backing for it. Yeah. That they will mm -hmm. not face a backlash, they will not lose their office, whatever, because they, 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 they have taken the, 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 this kind of, uh, these kinds of steps. Well, that's the critical part. That's the critical part, that they have to feel that they're not going to have the public against them. Otherwise, actually, they won't even be able to, to get it passed because in democracies, the executive leader can make a decision, but he, she needs to pass it through the legislative. And the yep. legislative is going to be, in fact, even more sensitive to public support, perhaps even than the executive will be. But, but you know, this um, is a beautiful thing, this 2%. It's just occurred to me, I've you know, I used to work in the kind of logo business or the, you know, the, there are these powerful symbols like the cross or many, you know, agencies ban the bomb symbol. Maybe, you know, and I was la laughed when U.S. politicians started wearing like a, like a U.S. flag. Like, I'm sure they know where they live. You know what I mean? But could we have, could we have a 2% badge? In fact, can mm. listeners start making 2% badges and we all start wearing a 2% badge and we'll all be saying to each other, come on, yeah, 2%, let's do it. We, we better yeah. do it soon, though, before it goes to 3%, which will happen at some point. <laughs> uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, I can hear the new call of young people, you know, the activists out on the street. Yeah. 2% for 1.5. 2% for 1.5. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and again, if, if you think about the next COP meeting in, in, in Egypt at the end of this year, in November, I think, yeah. Yeah. then that's a very, very clear message. Yeah. Uh, to the leaders assembled, okay, don't make kind of these promises about the future. If you're serious, mm. then uh, in uh, then sign the check now. Do you think that's clearer yeah. than 196 nationally determined plans that converge on some future unspecified <laughs> date with different trajectories? Come on, Tom! <laughs> <laughs> You didn't have when you said right. it, Tom. You didn't have your heart in it. Did I, I not? Yeah, yeah. So tell, the, the energy yeah, dropped yeah, a bit. Yeah. The, the, yeah. <laughs> So from that perspective, Yuval, uh, from that perspective and uh, given that this campaign, that you're launching this campaign, we always uh, like to ask the people that we invite on our podcast about um, the title of the podcast, Outrage mm -hmm. and Optimism. And so from, from the perspective of 2% uh, for 1.5, <laughs> what... Uh, what makes you still what makes you still very concerned and outraged other than the fact that we still haven't gotten to this so timing mm. is certainly one but what else uh, makes you outraged and um what are you truly optimistic about mm. yeah so so the outrage is about the fact that it's when you look at political debates around the world they are still dominated by the wrong issues. Mm -hmm. And yeah. again, the, the Ukraine crisis is, is, is a perfect example without going into the details of who is right and who is wrong and, and all that. It's whatever it is, it's clearly not an, ex an existential question like uh, the threat of catastrophic climate change, but it does threaten 
to kind of uh, monopolize not just the, the resources, but really the oxygen, yeah, the, the kind attention. of yeah. the attention that you talk about this, you don't talk about other things. And unfortunately, it's, you know, to make peace, you need everybody on board. Mm. To make war, one is enough. Mm. Or two, you because you need... have to be at war against someone. Uh, not really. I mean, <laughs> okay. there is a point when you are, I don't know, when you are kind of invaded and overrun, and you say, I'm not cooperating with this, I'm not agreeing to this, and it, it, it's not really workable. It's the kind of thing that you need two to tango, but just one to make war. Hmm. And um, so, so this is the kind of, of, of the outrage. And then the, the optimism is that, uh, with regard to climate change, is that it's not too late. Mm. And that we have all the resources we need. Yeah. We just don't have the wisdom and maybe the motivation. Once you kind of, if, if, you, if we can get the motivation, that everything else we need is already there. We have the economic resources. We have the basic the technology we need. We have, uh, uh, we have the science that we need. It's just that somebody needs to give the order, do it. That's it. Once the order is given by the right people, it's completely feasible. That's, that's really what this podcast should be called is who are these right people? But right. I think you entreat us to, to think about, uh, you know, suffering, slowing down, uh, conversational inclusivity, I read, and focusing on the main goal. And those are great. So maybe I'll, I'll, you raise the question of, of who are the right people. And I often wonder with, uh, among, like in my head, not just who are the right people, but where are the really important conversations taking place? Mm -hmm. It's one of the questions that, that really bothers me deeply. Because, you know, once upon a time, there was a place called Parliament, which was established in order to have the really important conversations. And at least in theory, this was a place where the kind of, not just some of the wisest people, but people who represent a lot of other people met together. Yeah. And um, and not just talked, but listened. It was kind of the, the idea was that you can actually be convinced by something that somebody else said. And this is no longer the case. <laughs> no. It's unheard of <laughs> to be convinced. I mean, such the, the, a good point. <laughs> and so it's clearly important conversations are not happening in Parliament. Mm. They are also mostly not happening, I don't know, on TV shows. Again, people just come to uh, give their, uh, 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 their ideas, but it's almost unheard of mm. for somebody to actually change their mind. Are you so building up to I'm, saying it's on podcasts that people are having the yeah, right? And yeah, and maybe this one. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> With podcasts also, the question is, it's not just having a conversation, but yeah. the important conversation. Like, yeah. the where important are the conversations that, uh, I don't know, the leaders of major parties whether it's in democratic countries or whether it's the, the leaders of the CCP in China, do they have converse, really open conversations when saying the right thing in the right way can actually change the mind of other people? And, uh, and, and, and that's part of the problem today is that uh, it's very difficult to know where these conversations take place and mm. of course to, to, to get into them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Saying the right mm. thing in the right way at the right time. I and said say. by the right person. And That's said it. by the right person. Yeah. yeah. Many, yeah. many rights there. Um, Yuval, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate your time uh, on this podcast, but more than anything, really appreciate that you continue to be such a thoughtful participant of all of these uh, of all of these conversations and keep them all top of mind for us. So thank you very much, and here's to a fantastic campaign: two percent for one point five. Two percent for one point five. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Yuval. Thank you.
So what a privilege to have Yuval back on the podcast again, and particularly to talk about this campaign and how amazing that he's now turning his mind and his considerable skills to this activist attempt to try to change the world. What did you both leave that conversation with? I was dazzled by um, his his ability to sort of reduce down to the essence. You know, he didn't say anything in our conversation that uh, people who've been working in climate change haven't heard before uh, on many different occasions. But I think he his ability to distill it, um, and uh, the phrase I'm going to pick up on that he particularly used is... Um, well, two things. First of all, the context that everyone was ignoring climate change and then everyone is is becoming despairing, that, that, that noticing that there's nothing in between. You know, it's a ridiculous flip because he called them, I think he called them both uh, positions where you don't accept responsibility. You say it's not really happening and then you say there's nothing we can do. Um, that's, that's fundamentally irresponsible either way. But then um, talking about just 2% of GDP being a political project and I love that phrase, that is manageable, um, that is doable, that we can come together as a society. And I, and I think, you know, one of the things that I was reflecting on that, that phrase and all the different kind of activists of which perhaps many of us are, many of our listeners are, have we really looked on this as a political project with what that might entail um, and, 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 and contrast it to other political projects? Um, and... Yeah, I, I've, I've, I left the the the, uh, the uh, interview with uh, an enormous sense of sort of uh, possibility and uh, born of simplicity. I would say that that was what I, the thing I took most of all. Well, Paul, I would like to um, lovingly disagree with you on one thing and enthusiastically agree with you on something else. So my loving disagreement is: I don't think, to quote you, it is a ridiculous flip to go from denying climate uh, to being in the, uh, in the depth of despair. First, I don't think it's the same people. Um, mm. But also, I, have, I, 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 I cannot step away from my own despair. And I don't think you can either, Paul, or Tom, or any of us, because there is a very profound pain in all of us that only grows every day at seeing the destruction that we are causing. So I wouldn't call it a ridiculous flip. I think especially um, the pangs of despair are very justified and, um, and are certainly present for all of us. But where I totally agree with you is on your comment about simplicity. I was really struck how someone uh, who I deem to be top of the list with respect to his capacity to step into the complexity of humanity and of society as it has evolved and to author books that are honestly, you know, each one of them is a Magna Carta. And then to turn almost on a dime the complexity of climate, which he says very humbly he doesn't understand climate change. He does. He definitely <laughs> understands the he complexity does, that we're yeah. dealing with. But, um, but then to put it forward as 2% of global GDP, so simple and so profound and so... Par- it's not simplistic. It's simple, profound, and very... Um, and I think very powerful. And the fact that he himself admits that, frankly, it's not his idea, this 2% of global GDP, it's been around for a while. And Mm. so he digs in to the works of so many economists who've been working on this for decades and picks up that idea because he decides it's actually a gem of an idea and it shouldn't be only an idea, it should be turned into a political project, as you point out. Um, and I just think that is nothing short of brilliant. Nothing short of brilliant, right? I, I just think that simple and profound is such an important, such a powerful combination. And that is what he has, um, he has done. So my admiration for him has only escalated. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I would agree on that simplicity point, and it's something we've really struggled with. But you know, given you both talked about that, which I agree with as well, I'll just make one other point, which is the bit of the interview that most struck me was when he talked about the construction of stories and what that does to our motivation. And when he talked about that, the Wailing Wall in Israel and how if, if one thing went wrong there, it would precipitate millions and billions of people around the world to rise up in a particular way. But that we don't do the same thing when we lose the Barrier Reef or the Amazon rainforest. And the reason for that, in the way that he tells it, is the construction of stories that fits behind it. And this, of course, is his big thing, right? It's stories that precipitate cooperation, that enable us to And behave. your big thing, Tom. And my, yeah, well... It's also your big thing. I humbly would suggest that I've had somewhat less of an influence in my intellectual thinking than Yuval Harari has in the world. Um, <laughs> You're young, <yeah>. Tom. <laughs> um, but I think that, but that really struck me. And it was the for the first time I really thought, wow, we have really internalized the wrong stories. And that was just a mistake. Mm -hmm. And actually all of the power of human creativity and our ability to defend our home and innovate our way out of this can be unlocked by having better stories about how we fit in the world and the role we can play and the cooperative nature of humanity. And then all of those things become true because they're the stories we then believe and they're the ones we act on. And I think Yuval has done more than anyone to help us understand that. Informed, we should remind listeners, by his very deep decades-long practice of Vipassana Buddhist meditation, uh, which he credits with many of the insights that has led to his understanding of the world. Um, mm, the way out is in. Uh, just one other thing that's sort of linked to the stories. You know, he concluded raising this question about where the important conversations are taking place. And, and you know, they don't appear to be taking place in parliaments, not taking place on TV. And his invitation for us to create spaces, new spaces, perhaps, or, or old, rediscover old spaces uh, where people can have those conversations and be listened to. Mm. Okay. So uh, unless any final thoughts, we will go to the music. Thank you as ever for joining us. This has been a great episode. What a privilege to have you, Val, back on the podcast. Uh, this week we have, is that it? No, no other points? I know Paul's got about three hours of I, monologue I've, he wants to add five in. hours yeah. of yeah. Yeah. No, we'll put that in the, in the, in the bonus. That. That'll be yeah. a, another day. Okay. <laughs> it's just stored up for later. Think of it as a kind of treat for Christmas, but it's February. Maybe your fourth tweet. Could be the fourth tweet. No. Yeah. Get a get a very comfy chair because there's going to be long, long podcasts. You know, there's a lot. There's a lot to. It'll help you go to say. sleep. Quite a bit of it's repetitive. <laughs> I'll right, be yeah. whispering and tapping the mic. So just think about this. Yeah, it's very important to understand. You know that, that, that essentially money and business is kind of controlling the game. <laughs> it's up to us. To, you get the okay, idea. Okay, so look forward to that. Uh, this week we have a brilliant piece of music. Uh, it's called Australia. It's by Nio, as I said at the beginning. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you, as ever, for joining us this week. We'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Kia ora. This is Nio, and you're listening to my new single, Australia. It was written in the Pilliga Forest, where there is still a lot of coal seam gas mining happening, and all across Australia. And the song is a reminder that the Aboriginal communities across this planet have the knowledge to look after this earth and to keep it going and keep it growing. So I hope you enjoy the song and I hope it brings meaning to the way that you treat the world around you. Thank you. <laughs> i
So there you go. Another episode of Outrage and Optimism. You made it to the end. Welcome. My name is Clay. I'm the producer of Outrage and Optimism. This is the part of the podcast where I send you off into the rest of your day, night, you know, whichever, with further listening, reading, watching, doing, with the hopes that it will help you just be. And from all of us at Outrage and Optimism, we're so glad that you're here. So the song that you just heard was Australia by Nio. And this week, as I was perusing through Nio's press kit, I discovered a few things. Let's start with number one. Number one, Nio has an EP called Without that you can stream and buy now on Bandcamp or wherever you get your music. But, you know, go buy it. Fantastic arrangements. She has amazing vocal stylings and, you know, her voice becomes more like an instrument at some points on this EP and it's, you know, hauntingly chill, just like her performance of Australia. Um, number two, she also has a jazz psychedelic group called Neon Groove. And if you're not sure what jazz psychedelic music is, go to the show notes to find out. Really fun, unique sound. She twists her voice through some effects, giving it that psych feel and it's really fun. It's a really fun and engaging exploration of the potential of music. So go check that out. And number three, she backed up Harry Styles on his most recent tour playing guitar and background vocals. Yeah, pretty awesome. Like stadiums and stuff. And you know, we know why, because she's amazing. Okay, all that to say, go listen to her music, go buy it. There's your recommendation for me and our production team. Nio, thank you for letting us play your music. Thank you to our guest this week, Yuval Noah Harari. I think I said this last time he was on, but his book, Sapiens, changed my life. You know, my jaw on the floor, reading it multiple times, and based on how many people listened to that episode, I don't think I'm the only one. So you can learn more about Yuval's organization, Sapienship, which is, you know, working to create a world that's responsive to our most important collective challenges. <coughs> Climate change. Excuse me. And 2% more, the campaign to invest just 2% of global GDP into developing eco-friendly technologies and infrastructure every year. So yeah, start small. Go read the first page of the site and then bring it up with a friend or a colleague over lunch or coffee. Yeah, averting the apocalypse is possible. Sapienship.co. Thank you, Yuval. Okay, and the last thing before you go, on Friday of this week, which is the 18th, our sister podcast, The Way Out Is In, available on all streaming platforms or wherever you get your podcasts, has Christiana on as a guest. I just finished editing the episode last night, and when I was done, I wrote it down here to make sure that I recommended it to all of you. In the episode, Christiana offers us her story as to how she discovered the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh, um, how mindfulness and deep listening and interbeing made you know, the Paris Agreement possible. And she even offers a little glimpse into the next chapter of her life. So it's a really beautiful opportunity. She gives us to get to know her a bit closer. And so yeah, go listen. Again, that episode is coming out on Friday. So if you're listening to this on Thursday, uh, click the link and hit subscribe. It'll show up in your feed. But if it's past Friday the 18th, the link will be there directly to the episode. Okay, that's it. Thank you for listening. You can find us on social media at Global Optimism. And if you love this podcast, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We read every single one. Have a fantastic rest of your week. We'll see you in the next. Bye.